So here we are, week 10. It's amazing to think that 10 weeks ago that we started together. And just think about how much you've learned in these 10 weeks and how much you have worked hard and really sacrificed to get to this point. So I commend all of you because it is very difficult. And I know that. <laughs> so next week you will be getting your HESI. <clears throat> I'm doing two things for you for the HESI. Tonight, I'm going to do that 95 slide PowerPoint. And that is directly from your NCLEX book. Okay. I went through the NCLEX book, put the HESI hints, everything in there, trying to uh, put it in one place easier to access. And then Thank you. to listen, you know, to me explaining things as we go. So you get, you can follow the book, you can follow the PowerPoint, and you're going to see it's almost the same thing there. I took a lot of time doing this last quarter, and I was told by uh, last semester students that it was really good. There was a lot of stuff on that that they saw reflected in the HESI. So that's the first thing I'm doing. Professor Stiles and Professor Luminoso have both just done a HESI review. I'm going to post those recordings tonight when I post my recording. So you'll have one, two, three HESI reviews right there. And I will put, um, again, the PowerPoint. Yes, it's on the week 10 information, but there's a lot of information on that. So I'll just reattach it for you like I normally do. <laughs> now, tomorrow at two o'clock, I'm doing what we call a last chance pediatric review. It's RNs and PNs. Now you're saying, but you're different. Oh no, you're not. You know, I teach both courses and sometimes I think your course is harder than the RN course. And I think <laughs> um, what I'm seeing is that you all are thinking so, so good. Now, how did I become a good RN? From the PNs that helped me through when I was a young kid. I mean, I was a, registered nurse at age 21 and I had the mentality of a 14 year old so <clears throat> when you have a good RN behind you backing you teaching you guiding you you become <laughs> the best so for me um, I thank all of the PNs and the future PNs now on that thing that I sent up there's a HESI Q&A that will be tomorrow and I go through all the growths of development, all the stages, and then I go through the body systems. And I go through questions that I think could be, if you had choices, how do you think? How do you get to that answer, okay? And I just hope my voice are continues. You, <laughs> are you recording that? I am. Everything is okay. recorded and that will be posted okay. again tomorrow also. Okay. <laughs> Now, let's go ahead and start. Thank you, Alexis. Let me go ahead and put it up. So, HESI review. And again, this is right from your NCLEX book. And it was something that they always say, when you're studying for a HESI, go to your NCLEX book, right? You go to your NCLEX book and it has everything about pediatrics, everything about med surge. It is a great resource for you. So <clears throat> developmental milestones, what should we know? You know, what, what are those ones that really stick out? Well, birth weight doubles at six months, triples by one year. Birth length, Remember, it's six inches, one inch for the first six months of life. So 50% of the height is in the first 12 months. Posterior fontanelles, the one in the back, are closed by about eight weeks. They start cooing and smiling at two months. Now they start turning their head when they hear you coming at three months. And moral reflex is that startle. They hear a loud noise or a jar and they hands up and feet up, it disappears. 
they should have their head up and standing up on their arms and holding their head up really good about four months. By six months, they should turn from the front to the back, back to the front. And about six months old is when you can start playing with your kids, play peekaboo. Now we've talked about fine motor skills. Well, we start out with that reflex grasp, then we go voluntary and we go to being able to put hand to hand. And it is about seven months it takes to do that. We know all of a sudden about seven to nine months, they're very picky, who am I gonna go to? So it's at that time. Sitting unsupported, that means no pillows or no propping at eight months. They should sit there and be able to play. They're crawling about 10 months. And then that little, taking the little fingers, they take and they want like a little Cheerio or a little puff ball off the uh, high chair. It starts out with that smush it and in the mouth. And then it ends up with pulling one at a time. They should wait bye-bye about 10 months. And somewhere between 10 to 12 months, they're walking with assistance and attempting to take it by their own. Now, some kids are running at a year and some kids are not walking yet, but as long as they're attempting. Now, by one year, 12 months, they should be able to say things like mama, dad, dad, milk, you know, juice, whatever they like. And then we know how do children explore the world? And it's all oral. And it's like, you know, smooshing and biting down on it, moving it in the hands. So it's that motor, but it's all that oral. And that's that soothing area. So, Hesse Hint, this is one of your discussion questions. This is why discussion questions are important. You're like, why do we do these things? Well, it's really hard for me to go into depth and to explain the protest, despair, denial, detachment, but you all did a discussion question on it. We know initially babies scream and yell, right? That's the protest. And then what happens? They go into despair, like they regress start sucking their finger, or maybe if they're potty trained, now they need a diaper. And then it's like, all right, they're not coming. They're sitting in the corner quietly. And then let's say it's been a couple of days because sometimes parents have to not be at the hospital. I mean, we would say, why would that happen? Well, if you're a single parent, you're working and you're almost losing your house, you need to get to work. You're gonna leave your child with professionals, the nurses that are professionals, and then just call. It does happen. It doesn't mean they're neglectful. It just means life. And then the parent walks in and what happens? They're like, okay, whoever you are. And they wanna have their nurse, who of course, we're gonna to try to arrange the same nurses. So this goes into a lot more growth and development. So the length doubles by about four years. Now we don't really see those um, height type things. We see the weight the first year tested on, but height by four years, not really, okay? Uh, when they achieve the adult height it's by two years, but that's something I've never seen a question, but throwing a ball over hand by 18 months two to three words by two years. And then scissors tie the shoes, four years, five years. And then um, one of the questions um, that I really like in these hints is thyroid, when a baby is born and they don't have enough thyroid hormone, they have hypothyroidism. We would probably figure that out because usually they don't move their bowels. Um, constipation is one of those um, side effects or one of those symptoms that we see in it. So at birth for the first 24, 36 hours, no stool, they will test for thyroid deficiency. Now, thyroid deficiency is just like adults, the dry skin, the sparse hair, constipation, cold intolerance, all of that. But in children, it's cognition and growth. Are they grown the way they should? If a infant doesn't get hormone therapy when they need it at first, their fine and gross motors are gonna be skewed. It's not gonna be where it should be. So how do we know that thyroid hormone therapy is effective? Well, they've got the motor control of their head. 
by four months, which is when they're supposed to. So understanding it was the four months head control, understanding why thyroid hormone, okay? So girls do grow more quicker than boys, two years before, 10 in girls, uh, 12 in boys. Temper tantrums, me, me, mine, mine, being egotistical is all about the toddler. Absolutely normal. It's what we do expect. And adolescents, we know that what are they looking for? You know, as Erickson says, and it's really good what Erickson says, sense of identity. They want to know, who am I? Um, it could be sexual. Do I like girls? Do I like boys? It could be career, academics. It could be friends. It could be what group in school do I want to be a part of? What do I want to look like? Short hair, long hair. How do I look pretty? How do I look whatever? These are things that the adolescent's going through. And now they're going through acne and they're getting taller and hair in places they're not used to. Can you imagine? They're getting a frustrating time. So they will start rebelling. They're trying to find their own way. And they do that sometimes by being disobedient to the parents, isn't it? I raised two adolescents as a single parent. I'm very aware of what happens. School age children, what do we talk about with Hesse? Or well, Hesse, with Erickson and school age? Well, school age children have an industry. That's their factory, that's their building. That's what they produce and do well. That's an industry, okay? The other stuff is their inferiority, they can't do it. So industry is what makes them feel great. That's their house, their business, and they do it well. And their same-sex peers are the most important in the school age. So children with bodily image, you know, know that children, uh, what this means, you've got the, the toddler. They feel if you stick them with a needle that it's going to have their insides burst out. Uh, preschoolers are into um, things like um, castration. Um, believe it or not. They're into, this is the age of the band-aids, right? They're going to bleed. Their blood's going to go everywhere and they're going to die. <laughs> and then school age, they're starting to get a little bit more agile, more mature. And now they're getting fear of loss of control. And what is an adolescent all about? Body image, body image. Am I going to end up with those curves or I'm going to keep up with this baby fat around the middle, right? That would be a girl. So accidents, accidents, always. Remember, accidents are the major cause of death. Um, we know that there's no filters on some young kids. They don't think before they do. We know the biggest one is motor vehicles, right? So figuring out how to protect the children, whether it's in sports, whether it's in car safety um, or around the home, what do they need to do? And there's a lot of brochures and stuff at these kids' hospitals. And as nurses, you know, we're going to be a part of that teaching. You know, when I first became a nurse, you really couldn't talk to the physicians. Now, I became a nurse in 1976. Physicians did most of the education, although I would always teach. Uh, it was something that I always felt that if I knew the answer... Um, I would talk to the patients and they would talk to me about it. So anyway, pain. Well, we usually use three types of pain scales usually. We know that um, faces, flack, and we also have numeric. Those are the big three that you mostly see questions about, okay? Um, cries, PRS. I mean, those are your younger kids. Those are more like your flack scale. That is faces, legs, the activity, crying, consolability. This is also used, the flack, for a nonverbal child. This child could be 18 years old and their cerebral palsy and they don't speak. That's also, you can tell just by the way they're acting what their pain is. We you know faces, it's great. You can sit there and pull it open and show a picture of the faces. And these young kids, three and up to about age eight, can point to the picture and they'll show you accurately what they heard. 
give it to an adult, they're always a 10. I mean, that's just what adults do. But children don't do that. So if they're pointing to a six, they're hurting quite a bit, okay? And always remember, remember to ask the child, you know, um, and making sure that they're understanding what you're asking, okay? And then, of course, numeric is just like adults. So in pain, you don't just have to give medicine, okay? Now, infants, what soothes an infant? I've already said it. It's a pacifier, right? So self-soothing. Sometimes it's just picking them up, it's holding, it's rocking them, and it could be distracting them. You know, if you have done everything you can, let's say you gave that Tylenol, that Motrin, or that, or even morphine, and the kid's still crying, just uncomfortable, well, bring in some stickers, put on a movie, give them an iPad, let's color a picture, let's play a game. I'm telling you, they just switch off and they don't focus on the pain. And it really does work. Now, how does it work the best? When you're on the child's developmental level. So again, with medicating a child, and I do this actually for any medicine, because children, it's milligrams, micrograms, units per kilogram. And uh, remember, there are some high-level ones, you know, your narcotics, your heparin, your digoxin, um, insulin, heparin. These need to be checked with another nurse, okay? That's a two-witness thing there. But um, the antibiotics, also, we can give too much, and it's 50 milligrams per kilogram. So always, always check them. Now, the doctor writes the order, the pharmacist checks it, and then comes back to you. So it's like a three check there. So, because um, mistakes are made. I mean, that's, we're not all infallible. If we're medicating for pain, you want a baseline. Always do vital signs before. Hopefully we'll see that heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure come down after we give it, right? Those PCAs or patient controlled analgesia pumps, you know, this is something that they're starting to do with younger children. They can push the button when they hurt. And again, this has to be a child who's aware of what they're doing. Not every child can have that, okay? You have to be selective of it. Um, also, if we have an alternate route besides giving a shot, no pinche as the Hispanic population says in Miami, you know, no pinching, no pinching. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going to. You see the tube and that little IV? I'm going to put it there and you're not even going to feel anything. And that's all they want. We're doing even intranasal like fentanyl today <laughs> for things like casting children. And it really works well. So I am injections. Yes, we can numb the area. We can put a cold pack on it before we give it. There's and distraction, you know, um, we're lucky in this area where I'm from, the uh, Children's Hospital has a really huge child life team. And you usually have one or two of them just stationed in the emergency room. And if you need to give an injection to a child who's scared and afraid, bring child life. They're going to be playing a game on an iPad, blowing bubbles, doing something. They're not even going to know what you've done. Now, communicable diseases, we didn't go over a lot of these, okay? So this is something that I would look at if I were you, okay? Measles, think of coplic spots, all right? That's one thing that you would see as related there. And we know it's uh, one of those M's that we give the vaccination at 12 to 15 months, and then later on. Varicella. Um, this is another one that we're not going to give till after they're a year old. Remember, this is a live vaccine, all right? So one thing about varicella and things that you're, you're um, asked about it is knowing that there's lesions. It's a virus that happens. It's like a herpes virus that they're sort of saying. Um, remember that when the scabs are all crusted over, that child is no longer um contagious okay and they're contagious two or three days before they even break out and that's what we usually get worried about so 
German measles is that one that pregnant women shouldn't be around. That's the one that they always say. So um, parents, mothers usually say, well, if I'm going to have another child, we're going to vaccinate all the children. And they will be getting that MMR, okay? And to make sure that they're not, um, not vaccine for it because it can damage and cause um, some deformities in an uh, unborn child. If they have um, a, a communicable disease, you know, let's say it is rubella, let's say it's pertussis, let's say it's chickenpox, all of those are extremely contagious, right? So number one, you put a mask on yourself, put a mask on the child and get them into one of those reverse flow rooms that we call it, which is your isolation, okay? Never, never treat with anything but acetaminophen or um, ibuprofen. We don't go to aspirin type stuff, all right? So um, fevers um, will be with any disease, but make sure it's never aspirin. Aspirin can cause raised disease, which is very dangerous and it's life-threatening. If you work in an area, a doctor's office, an ER, urgent care, that we see things that are not normal um, that all are reported to the health department, trying to find out where they're coming from. It could save outbreaks in the whole school systems, if you think about it. If the kid has like chicken pox and they're scratching like crazy, number one is always cut their nails. Always cut their nails. In fact, you know, you're, you're talking everything, pinworms, et cetera, goes in through, the in through the nails into the mouth. So children's nails should always be shorter as we possibly can. And there's, um, they have mittens that they can put on, especially at night, because at night kids tend to scratch and we're not there watching them all night long, right? And then there's all sorts of soothing baths, like ever hear of a vino, um, oatmeal baths, or even with oil in the baths, whatever it takes um, can help. There is times where the itching, you can give diphenhydramine, Benadryl, okay? Usually that's ordered, but there's other stuff in case we need to. And us always washing hands, protect yourself always. So nutrition, 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 right? Well, we know the first year of life, kids usually eat, they do well. They have their milk the first six months, whether it's iron fortified formula or breast milk. And then the second six months we add on foods and then they become toddlers and they become the pickiest, finickiest children on the planet. They go through what we call a physiologic anorexia. They barely eat. So what's the problem with that? It's the amount of nutrition and vitamins that they are not taking. So with that being said, we need to make sure that they're getting enough of vitamin A, C, B6, B12. And then again, the time where children stop eating because I'm overweight, I'm too fat, I need to be skinnier. It's, you know, this males and females as adolescents, remember body image, they're eating a power bar and a bottle of water and going for the day. Remember, they need more calories. They're not getting it. They need protein, zinc, calcium, and iron. And remember that at a pre-adolescent growth spurt, that 25% of their total height Okay, they're growing a lot. They need more. They're not getting it. It needs to be watched. So whenever you're concerned about dietary, are they eating enough? Number one, ask them, what did you eat yesterday? You know, food or liquid, doesn't matter. And then do a three-day history. Even the whole family, tell me what you're eating. And this is showing food choices and stuff that's in the house. And it's giving, you know, the healthcare provider uh, an understanding, right? So another one, they want to know things like, do they have milk and meats and fruits and vegetables and all the good stuff, right? So understanding that can help us. Maybe they need a vitamin or supplement. You know, you can't force, a, you can force a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And that's a toddler right? The younger kids. You can put that food in front of them. It doesn't mean that they're going to eat it. Are you going to probably have a kid vomiting on you, right? Because that's what usually will happen in the toddlers. So diarrhea. 
Diarrhea is a lot of, you know, waste that comes. Remember, the, di the stool is rich in alkaline, right? All of the um, digestive enzymes are all alkaline. So you're getting rid of it like crazy, okay? What are you left with? Acid. Alkaline's gone. Acid is there. So diarrhea, you're losing fluid. You're losing electrolytes, potassium, sodium, right? And with this metabolic acidosis, children do not do well with dehydration. They go in total body shutdown and they can die with um, just being dehydrated. So these are four things that you see with dehydration, uh, which is shock, which is getting rid of all that extra stool or liquid from you. You're going to have a lower blood pressure, an elevated heart rate. The skin color is not going to be good. You're going to get confused, decreased urinary output. You can have skin tenting, um, decreased capillary refill, did I say? Um, and then I think that mental status, just all of a sudden, they're very lethargic and they look pale. They look um, I call it almost green is it, the color. They just come in down and you can see it. And even the ears I like looking at on children, they see them pale, guess what? That child is uh, getting there. When I see a kid coming in looking bad, the first thing I'm gonna do is listen to a heart rate. I wanna know how quickly I need to get an IV in that child. And that will determine who am I gonna see first. So as we get even um, younger kids, a little baby with diarrhea, vomiting, whatever, losing fluid, when they cry and there's no tears, I think it's the saddest thing that we see, right? Now, of course, mucous membranes are gonna be dry. If we had a weight before and after that was accurate, we could see a decrease. And, you know, taking care of an infant that has a fontanelle, we can see so much because of that fontanelle. You're gonna see that concave in, even the eyes sunk into the head. Um, and you'll see that white, grayish, greenish looking color to them and pale, pale ears you'll see. Now, we're gonna be giving IV boluses and that's great. Remember, we never ever put potassium in those IVs until we see them urinating, okay? Very important. We never bolus with potassium. We never bolus with dextrose, only normal saline or ringers. Now, how do we know urine output's gotten better? Well, that would be the, the side effect of giving fluids, right? It's what we're looking for. Well, you need to know it's one to two milligrams, milliliters per kilogram per hour. The way five kilograms, it should be five to 10 mLs per hour. Don't think of like uh, adults, minimum is 30 mLs per hour. That's what they teach, right? That's the lowest. Well, in children, it's, uh, you know, one to two mill milliliters per hour per kilogram. So treating diarrhea, we're going to be looking at the hydration status. What would you see if all of a sudden you're giving fluids to a child who has diarrhea and you've given it a bolus? What would happen to those vital signs? We started with an elevated heart rate, right? What's going to happen? You're getting fluid back in you. It's going to decrease. And then you have a blood pressure that's low. It's going to increase. You know, so these are things that we'll be looking at initially. Now, if you have diarrhea, don't put anything in the rectum. It's going to stimulate more diarrhea. So don't take temperatures rectally. And when you're dehydrating, you know, give the fluids that you need to. And remember, electrolytes will be on a maintenance. They won't be when we bolus them. That will be like after we give 10 mLs per kilo, 20 mLs per kilo. After that, we're going to be given a maintenance IV at a decent clip of a rate, okay? Of course, we'll be checking the stools, making sure what's going on there. Um, checking the urine-specific gravity, what would you see? I mean, if you're dehydrated, where's your specific gravity going to be? It's going to be high. It's concentrated. It's like thicker urine, right? It's darker colored. 
then you're going to put all this fluid in, that specific gravity is going to drop. So there's so many things that you can do to look at a child to see if they're getting better, right? And always, always, always be careful, universal precautions on everybody and wash hands. Now, child abuse is everybody's responsibility. It's not just an RN, it's PNs. You know, it's what, what is our responsibility? Now, I've seen a couple cases of horrific child abuse. And what I did is I reported it to the head physician, whoever was in charge. And I reported it to the charge nurse. And then, of course, they went and got the people and the police and DCF and did what they had to do. And the end results on these several cases was that the child was safe in the end. That's your goal. Keep the kid safe. Now, how would you know it's abuse? Well, it's not always blatant. Sometimes you've got to really look. You've got to say, well, you know, the kid has this, but they said it was caused by that. It doesn't make sense. Or we're seeing them coming in more frequently. Um, these various stage of healing bruises and stuff on the body that's telling you there's constant sort of something happening to the child. I mean, burns are easy to see, ball patches, um, failure to thrive. And this was a big case that I did. Child was placed in a room, strapped to a bed, couldn't move, and they didn't feed him for I don't even know how long. Like the last time I had heard it was a month. This kid came in on his last breath. Now, the kid made it. The kid has a new family today, but it was failure to thrive. It was, there was no question. This was definitely an abuse case, you know, and remember you are responsible as all of us as medical professionals. If we suspect it's better to check than it is not to check. Now poisoning, it's, you know, kids love to get into everything. You know, I think the most of all the things that I see is Flintstone vitamins. They just think they taste good. Yes, Jean Louis. Yeah. For the abuse, we able to report it to the child nurse or to the state. Well, if you are on a um, doing home visits, you would report it to your supervisor. <laughs> Tell them this is what's going on, and then they can call it in. And if they're not doing it, and you still feel, you can still call it in. Okay, it's a tricky situation there. One of the things about um, taking in things like, um, you know, simple vitamins uh, is not a bad thing. We know Tylenol is really bad for the liver. Um, I've seen them eat rat poison, grandma's um, heart medication, uh, of course, those Tide balls. But a young kid who wasn't into that adolescent thing that was going on. The one thing is we never, ever, ever, ever tell a child to be vomiting. So we don't give Epicac anymore. That was years ago. We don't do that. What we recommend is call poison control. And a poison control will tell them what they can drink or what not to drink in order to neutralize what's in there. So respiratory distress, what do you see? These are such big, broad concepts here. Well, respiratory distress means you're not breathing right, which if you're not breathing right, you're not getting oxygen and you're not getting rid of carbon dioxide. So what would you look like? This is the way my mind thinks. Well, you're restless, right? You're, you're like oxygen starved. You're going to start breathing faster to try to, where's that oxygen? I can find it. Plus now you're getting really scared, anxious, because you are becoming hypoxic, right? Your heart rate's going to go up because it's trying to make up the oxygen and because you're scared. You are going to be getting diaphoretic because of all this extra work. In infants, you're going to see their nasal or nostrils here, in and out, you know, it, and it's like with each breath and it's going to go in and out. Also, at the end of a breath, they go, eh, eh, at the end of a breath. When I see a young infant 
flaring and just hearing that, that kid's going right back to the trauma room. That kid is really this close to being intubated, that severe respiratory distress. Then we open it up when we see the retractions, we hear that there's hardly breath sounds or they're full of fluid, right? That head bobbing is one of those things on those children too. And we know that the PO2 is down, CO2 is up, like I said, and their color is going to change. So plans, what do we do for asthma? Well, asthma is air gets in, it gets trapped, right? And then you have to push to get it out. And there's this expiratory wheeze. It's a severe, everything clamps down. So there's hardly any air moving either way, okay? What do we need? Well, number one for a child, get them in a position they're comfortable in. They want to sit on mommy's lap wherever they want to sit it. As long as we can get an aerosol to them, well, that's where they can stay. I'm not going to try to put them on a stretcher. It doesn't matter where they are. They just need the treatment, right? Your kids we're talking about. You need that fast-acting bronchilator. This is your albuterol, your venolin, right? And steroids, depending on how severe the asthma attack is, is it going to be given an oral steroid or intravenously? Of course, we always need fluid because, you know, all of the extra respirations, this is drying up, right? You're getting dehydrated just by losing um, moisture in your breath, which it can happen. Um, we're going to be given either fluids for replacing that or orally if they can. Um, the one thing I warn you about oral in asthma, don't give cold fluids. I used to like say give an ice pop because kids always eat it. That cold can trigger it to continue, okay? So it's always room temperature, believe it or not. It's what I found out through my experience. We know blood gases, respiratory acidosis, low pH, high CO2. That's basic it in a nutshell. So if we need to, we'll put them on oxygen or we'll put them on those mist type of masks, getting that moisture and getting trying to open it up. We know that a PO test, O2 sat above 90 is okay, um, but um, we're gonna put them on oximetry. If those O2 sets start dropping, then we know we're in trouble. It's really close monitoring it, okay? And then what we usually do is for these children, you know, to prevent a lot of these things, um, they'll be placed on a maintenance, right? Um, in the critical care, they're gonna be given, you know, that albuterol. There's also something called Atrovent, which is, something that has a little steroid in it, and it also helps get into the lungs and calms it down. So there's a lot of different things that can be done to help them. So cystic fibrosis. Now, cystic fibrosis is twofold. The lungs are full of secretions, and the small intestines doesn't have pancreatic enzymes, and um, there's a bullary obstruction, which means no fat digestion's going on. When you don't digest fat, it's going to be lost in the stool. And again, this is going to be a um, dietary nutrition problem. So cystic fibrosis, one of the things is besides the nutritional thing, besides the uh, lungs, it also gets rid of sodium salt through the pores. Uh, this child, you will never take a salt shaker away from them. If the mother was to lick the skin, it would be extremely salty, okay? So children with cystic fibrosis needs more calories. Their bodies are working harder, their lungs are working harder, they're burning more calories. So it's 150%. So we're watching their respiratory, uh, making sure there's no infections. Um, how would you know there's an infection? Well, increased coughing, increased secretions, uh, 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 temperature. And they say, and this is an immunosuppressed child. 
Any kid with a 100.5 fever or higher needs to call their healthcare provider. Sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, rheumatoid arthritis, any of these. If they have a fever, they're immunosuppressed. Their body can't fight it. Call the healthcare provider so we can get some antibiotics started. Now, the other thing with cystic fibrosis besides respiratory is the nutritional. Well, we'll be giving a enzyme. Pancreatase is one of the names of it, but it's a pancreatic enzyme. Now, with young kids, we can give a little bit of, um, we can sprinkle it on it, but making sure that they're getting the meds as they do it. They say usually put it in a smaller amount if possible. So you're going to give it with applesauce, rice, or cereal. Um, older kids, we can sprinkle it over the food and just making sure what you give them, they're going to eat, right? Now, as I said, they're not absorbing fat. This is biliary obstruction, pancreatic insufficiency. The stool's going out, and it's this foul-smelling, bulky stools that come out. But it's all the fat vitamins. So making sure that we're going to be supplementing those vitamins. Again, part of treatment. So we are going to be giving just daily respiratory treatments, making sure that they work. Um, we're also going to be doing postural drainage, chest CPD. And remember, we give that aerosol, that albuterol, that venolin first. Open the lungs up, then do chest PT, postural drainage, and that will help all of that mucus to come up a lot, lot easier. So nutrition-wise, we're going to use those enzymes, but still, we're going to have a diet high in protein, high in fat. It's going to be, um, we're going to give them, I mean, we're not going to do high fat on cystic fibrosis. We're going to do high calories, high protein, and carbohydrates, low fat. Sorry. If you give too much fat, it's just going to end up a big abdomen bloated, right? Can you that I'm interrupting. Excuse me? Can you repeat that? I apologize for interrupting. That's okay. No, please don't ever apologize. I don't mind. If you don't know, you don't know. So thank you. So in cystic fibrosis, you're losing fat, right? Because the body can't absorb it. So we're going to give high calories. We're going to give high protein. This is not high fat. It's low fat. We gave too much fat to these children and you can't absorb it. It's going to cause abdominal bloating, cramping, abdominal pain, and more diarrhea. So we don't want that. And these kids, keep them active. You know, they need to be up and out and moving like kids. Um, you may not have them running in soccer, but, you know, I always say a swimming pool is a great place for these kids. Okay, what about the kid who needs oxygen? There's all different ways we can give it. We have that oxy hood. It's clear. Little infants can suck on a pacifier. It's accurate. It's awesome. We can put those little prongs in. It's a nasal cannula. But remember, it bothers them, and they tend to flick at it. So you have to tape them on their chins. Now, a tent. A tent is something, it's a big plastic that goes over the head. And in that um, is a moisture and it's oxygen. Uh, and you have to keep it, you know, tucked in and the kid there. Now, some of the times, um, parents have to get underneath it with them. Or they have to take that, put it right in their face that they're getting all that moisture. If that's what they need is moisture, we'll do whatever we need to. But as I said, it's moist air. Make sure we change that you know, pajamas, the shirt, the gown, whatever they're wearing, you're going to more than once a day, it's going to be needing for that. We have to make sure we're measuring oxygen, of course, pulse oximetry, and um, periodic blood gases. Now, blood gases on a kid who doesn't have arterial lines in is very invasive. So um, they do the little capillary ones, uh, but still it's pinching a finger. And these kids don't like it. So we try to do them, you know, not as a routine. Now, epiglottitis. 
if we don't take care of croup, which is upper airway, it's a swelling, and air can't get in, inspiratory strider. If we don't take care of that barking cough on croup, it turns into epiglottitis. And the major uh, organism for this is Haemophilus influenza. Okay? Now, in epiglottitis, in croup, in tonsillectomies, anything that's doing with swelling in the oral pharyngeal area, you never go in there with a tongue depressor and you're not going to go look in there because you're going to end up, you know, making more swelling going in there. Also, children, we got to keep them calm. If we have to put an IV in them, they're going to get frustrated. Put them in the mother's arms, distract them, you know, um, and then have somebody help you and get that one who's really good at starting IVs to get this kid in, especially if they're epiglottitis. You don't want them overly stimulated because it will cause more swelling. Now, bronchiolitis is another word for RSV. You're going to hear it called RSV. You're going to call it bronchiolitis. This is a child. It's a viral disease. These should be in their rooms alone by themselves. Um, sometimes they'll put two kids with RSV in together. This is more um, dangerous on children six months and less, or I would even say the first year. It's all about mucus in the airway and trying to suck, swallow, and breathe. And again, it gets into nutrition. Can they suck, swallow, and breathe? They tired out really quickly. Um, as nurses, again, always universal, washing your hands um, before they eat, very gently. Don't be aggressive. Make sure we try to clear up you know, whatever is sitting there. Um, airway secretions, and we're going to feed them. Now, if they can't maintain hydration orally, we're going to stick in an IV on them. If we are going to put them on an antiviral, it's actually riboflavin is what we put them on, right? called riborol. It's um, antiviral medication. Usually, we just let it ride. We don't give them anything. But what if this kid is a... Uh, congenital heart defect. What if this kid is cystic fibrosis? You give them an extra virus like this and extra secretions, it's too much for them to handle. I mean, a premature infant, you know, those children, you don't want them to get RSV. So we can give palfizumab. The other name is Synergist. And it's once a month from winter to early spring, and it helps, it's that immunization for the first year only. And that helps stop them from getting it. So, I mean, bronchiolitis, RSV, mucus, of course, number one concern is airway. So respiratory disorders are the primary reason um, kids miss school, that they are to the doctors or in ER visits, we know that. Respiratories is um, something that, of course, it's number one. If we don't have an airway, we don't have anything else. So make sure you look at the parameters. They might be talking about a six-year-old and give you a respiratory rate. And is that respiratory distress? Well, how do you know? You have to know the respiratory rates. So they said the respiratory rate was 40 on a six-year-old. Well, that's high. Now, if you said it was 40 on a one-year-old, Eh, that's not too bad. So you've got to think about these things. Otitis media, middle ear. It can be inside or it can pop and come and just ooze everywhere. It is an infection. It is anything in the upper airway. Remember the ears are one of those outlets where mucus can go. And that's where it does go, especially if your nose is all plugged up, goes into your ears. And what do we have in our mouth all the time? It's staph. We all have it. It's just part of being normal. When it gets up into the ears, it creates an infection. So antibiotics, they can have very, very high fevers with this one. 
So always be careful. These are young children that usually have these mostly. So making sure that we know about febrile seizures and monitoring their temperatures. Um, they can go in a bath, but you know, something, what I say, just undress them, give them acetaminophen, give them ibuprofen. I give them cool liquids. I take their socks off their feet, let them walk on the floor. All those things will cool them down. You don't want them to be put in cool and if you go it too quickly, you're going to have a seizure. So yes, the book says tepid baths, but I'm telling you, be careful with it, all right? If the left ear hurts, let them sleep on the left ear. They say put a warm compress on it. Sometimes kids will take it and throw it across the room. Some kids say it hurts, okay? So it's something that you'll have to learn. I usually see an ear pain. I go get the ibuprofen and I go get them a warm pack. And I'll give them the ibuprofen. I said, here, put it there. It might help. And they put it on and they throw it. it. goes, oh, I don't like that. So, but you try. You always try. So, tell us all how it is. This was acute glomerular nephritis. This was on the last exam, right? It could be viral pharyngitis, bacterial, um, and it could be strep. You usually either see the viral or you see the strep throat, right? Those are the two things. Remember, strep throat, which is not treated, can cause acute glomerular nephritis, which means the kidneys stop working and you stop urinating. So all of the trouble with that starts. We can reverse it by giving antibiotics. Also, rheumatic heart disease. It does a lot of things to the body and rashes and nodules and joints, and uh, but it does affect the um, heart valve, usually the mitral valve. Once the damage is there, there's nothing they can do, but everything else will go away with antibiotics, okay? Now, this is telling you a little clue about surgery. Now, with tonsillite, with having a tonsillectomy, um, one of the big things is after surgery, they've taken and cut the tonsils adenoids out and cauterized the area. So there's huge scabs there. The incidence of bleeding can happen very easily with this one. So what they're telling you here in this hint is make sure that their, their blood isn't too thin do that prothrombin time or that partial prothrombin time, um, especially if there's some sort of bleeding coagulopathy disorder in the family, okay? Um, if it was elevated, we would do things to, you know, correct that. Um, why is it so high would actually be the first thing. Do they take too much ibuprofen, you know, or is a bleeding problem or are they, you know, hemophiliac, we don't know. I mean, a lot of things are found out just by doing routine procedures. So when they're done with a tonsillectomy, um, they're giving some ice chips. You're going to be getting antibiotics to make sure that we don't get an infection because what's in that mouth? I told you, staff, we don't want it to get infected. And fever, they stay with acetaminophen and not ibuprofen because it does cause a little bleeding, right? Now, if you see a kid post on selectomy and they are swallowing all the time, just have them open their mouth. Don't stuck anything in there, but you'll see the blood right there on the tongue. Um, that would be something they need to get back to their... Um, your surgeon and many times they've got to go back to the OR and have it cauterized. If they're vomiting fresh blood, you know, that's something I've seen one time in my life. It was a seven year old girl. I believe she was seven. She had just gone for her week visit to the ENT and on the way home, she vomited and a big clot of blood came out and she continued vomiting. This girl filled up one of those pink basins that you use to wash um, patients with, halfway of blood and clots. She's seven years old. She went hemovolemic. So I literally picked her up, 
didn't matter, my back hurt. <laughs> just picked her up, ran into the trauma room. I got another nurse to help me. We started an IV, got the physician in and bolstered her with fluid because she was going. It was just, you know, and her heart rate was 180. So I know this girl is a sick girl. But in the end, they came. She was fine. Uh, we got her up to the OR and they cauterized it and she went home the next day. But you can see that clearing the throat, being too active, all of these things can be a big thing just on tonsils. So bronchodilators, um, we know what they do, right? They open the lungs. Asthma, what do you see? Coughing, all that respiratory stuff. Um, also expiratory wheezing. Nutritional support for cystic. Well, we need good proteins. We need good carbs and watch out for those fats. And remember, it is genetic. So again, genetic counseling would be good if we determine it. Seven signs of respiratory distress. We could go on and on on that, can't we? Child in a mist tent. Do they have to stay underneath that tent? Can mommy go in that tent? Can they be held on, the, you know, on a chair next to it with that hose on them? As long as they're getting the moisture, it's okay if the kid's calm, all right? The kid who has epiglottis will be in that tripod. Will look like the old lady um, with um, COPD and can't breathe. They're bent over. It's trying to move the epiglottis in a place where some air can get into that trachea. Chronic ear infections, we know it's all about hearing. And remember, hearing problems causes speech problems. Those things are connected, all right? Post-op complications, we know the big thing is bleeding on tonsillectomies. Now, congenital heart disorders. Well, we have blue hearts and red hearts, right? Cyanotic, acyanotic. Now, polycythemia, do you understand why what polycythemia is? And why would a congenital heart defect have it? Well, let me explain it to you so you'll understand. If you have a cyanotic child, their O2 saturations normally where we want them at birth is 75 to 85% O2 sat. And that's normal. But the body doesn't know that, does it? So what does the body do? It produces red blood cells more than normal. Why? What do red blood cells carry? Oxygen. So they're trying to produce the red blood cells that should get the oxygen to get to the body. What does all of these red blood cells do? It elevates the hemoglobin and hematocrit, causing polycythemia. Now, let's go further. A normal hemoglobin hematocrit could be 14 and 42, right? Polycythemic children, 18 and 54. That is a normal H and H, hemoglobin hematocrit for a congenital heart defect. The body's trying to make cells to carry oxygen. That makes sense now, doesn't it? They're gonna do an EKG, always anybody going to get that. But the echo is where we start on these children, looking what's going on. What do you see with congenital heart defects? Well, it could be the heart rate, the sound, the blood pressure. Murmurs are a big thing. Or it could be pulses up to on the arms and nothing on the legs, the coarctation, right? It could be that they're clubbing of the digits when they're older. Um, and the big thing that we see in these children, and sometimes this one, D, is specific to children with coarctation who weren't discovered at birth. These kids come back to us at two and three months old. Nobody knew what to do with them. Nobody figured it out, but they're poor feeding. They're not gaining weight. They're failure to thrive. They're breathing fast. They don't know what's happening. And we find out it's that coarctation pushing fluid back into the heart, into the lungs, causing failure. So that is a just an absolute classic sign of it. Regurgitation all the time, respiratory infections, again, activity intolerance fatigue, 
their hearts are just trying to get oxygen around and you know just doing that is a lot so put that feeding in there it's a lot for them and any history of maternal infection so what are normal heart rates neonates 140 to 160 a one-year-old could be 100 to 120 you need to go back and look at these numbers remember if a child's in pain crying or a fever, it is normal for those heart rates to be elevated. So usually we try to look at a heart rate at rest. So we need to make sure with these congenital children, it would be small frequent feedings and we can increase the calories so they don't have to take as much fluid, right? So it could be uh, usually, let's say like um, Enfamil, common um, iron fortified formula. And Enfamil is 20 calories per ounce. Do you know they have one that's 30 calories per ounce? So they don't need that much. So less volume, same calories. Or breast milk, we can have these little packets. It almost looks like powdered sugar and it fortifies, it gives calories to the breast milk. So again, they maybe they can't breastfeed a lot, but the rest of it we can give in a bottle with the extra calories, right? Some children are so um, weak that we can do tube feeds, but again, don't ever forget an infant who's unable to eat for any reason, whether it's because they're tuckered out or maybe it's due to a medical condition, never forget a pacifier. Why? They self-soothe there, right? This is the way normal growth and development, exploring the world in their mouth, it soothes them, don't forget that. Heart failure, just a lot of things I just discussed, isn't it? The heart doesn't beat, what happens? It fills up in the lungs and now less space, less oxygen, and now you're gonna see all this stuff again tachypnea, tachycardia, difficulty feeding, um, cyanosis, grunting, wheezing. Um, and because in heart failure, it's all this extra fluid that they're keeping and it's really not being pumped through their kidneys as much, you're gonna see sudden weight gains. Why do you think we weigh a child in the hospital every day at the same time? Because we're looking for that weight gain or loss, right? And then of course, if you're working hard, you're gonna be diaphoretic. And hepat hepatomegaly, now that's a liver enlarged. You know what happens there? It's like those lungs get so full of fluid that the right side's trying to put, you know, the blood up into the lungs to oxygenate, but the right side is hard to push. So backwards failure. It goes from the right ventricle, right atrium, down into the inferior vena cava, and it fills up the liver instead of the lungs on the left side of failure. On the right side, it's the liver. And you do see them. You'll see them two, three finger breasts below the, um, this, the border of the, the um, ribs. You can actually feel a very smooth liver sitting there. And that's because of failure. So what are we gonna monitor? This is fluid balance, right? This, this is um, nutrition. There's so many things involved with this. So we are gonna be monitoring their lungs, of course, elevate the head of the beds, give some oxygen. If they need diuretics, digoxin to slow down their heart, we're gonna give it. Digoxin and furosemide are one of the most common thing that we give our little infants, believe it or not, brand new ones. We're gonna be weighing them. Usually we just do it once a day. I've never seen it every shift, every 12 hours, but usually once a day. Um, of course, intake, output, daily weights. Anything fluids, intake, output, daily weights. These children, if they're older children, will watch that salt. And we're not going to let them have that salt shaker. And we're going to be careful in the foods that are not too overly salty. Like they wouldn't be getting pretzels with salt on them or potato chips with salt on them. We really got to be careful. We don't want them just to suck up all the fluids and keep it in there. So one of the things that we have learned 
um, especially when I worked in the cardiac ICU at Nicholas Children's, was there are three or four different scales in there, and they're all numbered. And when we weigh a child on one of those scales, we put down what number scale it was. Because you know, there's scales, the doctor's office, I'm always 10 pounds heavier, aren't you? I mean, come on, the doctor's office always wants me to weigh more. Mine at home, I'm 10 pounds less. Well, that's just showing you every scale can be different. And when you're talking about children, heart failure, monitoring it closely, you want as accurate as possible. Now we talked a little bit about rheumatic fever. We know it's due to that strep infection, right? So again, this is antibiotics on these children and um, they'll be getting some sort of aspirin. And that's just to let the bloods go. Um, or maybe sometimes they put them on a little Coumadin because of that valve. We just want that blood to be moving around. Remember, these children are going to get antibiotics and they're going to be on prophylactic for up to five years. Kawasaki is a acute systemic vasculitis. Oh, what does that mean? Well, vascular itis, vessels itis, it means your blood vessels are inflamed. So it can cause a lot of little microembolus and spasms in there. And it can cause um, these ballonings of the blood vessels and they can explode and they're worried about coronary arteries, right? So what do you see? Very difficult, difficult thing to diagnose. Um, this is one of those things that we look at each other and even I, who was really good at cardiac and working in the ER, I'd have to really look at these kids. There are times the big red eyes, they come in, you'll see those swollen or crackly, you know, peeling hands and uh, soles of the feet. You might see that or you may not. But usually these kids have been sick for a while. Um, if they have that um, redness, that strawberry tongue, that's easy to see. Um, and of course, that peeling swollen palms of the hands or a soles of the feet, you can see. Now, again, this is a viral thing. So you want to boost the immune system, give IVIG. You're going to be given acetaminophen as you need, but these children get high dose aspirin. And high dose aspirin is to thin the blood and it's an anti-inflammatory. It also can help with a fever too, right? Again, we're worried about the heart. So intake output, you've got that red strawberry tongue, take care of it. Be careful what food you give to them, all right? Shunting could be right to left, left to right. Um, most I've talked to you about is how blood can go from the left side to the right side. Um, and it's just remember, it goes from big resistance, a big flow to least resistance. For instance, think about the right side of the heart. Blood just gets there from the last of a heartbeat, right? So it dribbles into that right atrium and right ventricle. Well, at birth, they have that patent foramenal valley, right? That's that little opening between the right and left atrium. Well, there are four veins from the lungs, pulmonary veins, that hit that left atrium, putting a lot of flow. So where do you think this child's going to flow from? From the left atrium to the right atrium, and then it goes back into the lungs again. So that's a good shunt to you describe about. ASD, VSDs are all both increased pulmonary blood flow because it goes shunts from the left side back to the right side and back into the lungs. Four defects with tetralogy of fallot. It's all right-sided stuff. This is easy to remember. It is right ventricular hypertrophy. It's pulmonary artery stenosis. It is a hole between the bottom chambers, a ventricular septal defect. And then because of that, the aorta moves over. It's called an overriding aorta. Objectives for treating heart failure, get rid of the fluid, right? And maintain nutrition. Interventions to reduce the workload of the heart, 
Well, things like increasing calories and frequent small feeds and doing cluster care together and letting that child rest. Dig dig oxygen toxicity in the infant. How would you know? What would you teach a parent about dig toxicity? Well, dig toxicity is dangerous. Dig oxygen is to slower and strengthen that heartbeat. Sometimes the kids home for a while. Dad gave the dig. I gave the dig, and they did that three days in a row. And all of a sudden, the only thing they may see is the kid vomiting. When you have a child going home on dig oxygen. Yes, I like to teach them how to count a heartbeat, but I also tell them if the kid vomits, you're not going to give that medicine again, okay, if you have given it. And if they, you haven't given it, you're not giving it, you're calling the doctor, letting them know your child is vomiting. That could be the only sign. Now, in adults, they have yellow, spotty, hazy stuff. <laughs> An infant can't tell you that but they can vomit. They might even show that little retchy nausea stuff. Risk of cardiac cath, the biggest one is bleeding. That's the one that you need to know about that. Uh, cardiac complications with rheumatic fever, and that's that mitral valve, valve destruction, and it will be um, permanent. So it needs to be treated medically or surgically. Medications for rheumatic fever, Oh, you need your antibiotics. And remember, it's going to be prophylactic for five years. So neuromuscular, let, let's go into Down syndrome. Chromosome 21. I've seen chromosome 21, 18, 15, 11, and 9, all considered that Down spectrum, okay? Just to let you know, you don't have to know that. Complication of Downs, always. First thing we check for is cardiac. Do they have a hole in their heart, VSD, um, which is the most common? Or do they have these other two, AV canal or truncus? You don't have to know the names. It's just congenital heart defects. Remember, they got flat nose and all the mucus sits there. So they get a lot of respiratory difficulties. They've got a big tongue. They've got feeding problems. They are delayed. Cognitively, they're delayed. And they've got, you know, the skeletal. They've got these really flexible joints, but they've got short, stubby fingers, their toes and their fingers, stick, thumbs stick out. So all of these things are those things that you'd see with a child with Downs. One of the things about Downs children, you know, I fell in love with a Downs kid when I was uh, 12 years old, 13 years old. I was a lifeguard and a junior lifeguard at that point. And I used to teach swimming to the Downs children. And I remember getting their um, confidence. Children who would never dive in would dive in the pool for me. Children who would never go anywhere where they couldn't touch would go into the deep end with me. And I got children swimming. And these children are the most wonderful, sweetest, most huggable, kissable children. And um, I've seen so much more being done for them. Today, with speech, physical, occupational therapy, they can do more than you would ever imagine. These children are going to college today, usually one course at a time with a mentor, but it can be done and they can live on their own. Now, cerebral palsy. Biggest thing is that low birth weight, premature infants, um, maternal infections, and then there is hypoxemia at birth can cause it. Uh, what do you see with CP? Well, cognitively, they're not going to be there. There is something with their brain. It tends to misfire, so they have seizures. And there is failure to thrive. One of the things with cerebral palsy is they've got problems with their muscle and coordination and the muscles doing what they want. So if they're eating orally, we need to prevent aspiration. Sometimes you have to hold the jaw as they are swallowing and chewing and give them time. These children, you can't rush. Spina bifida. Spina bifida is when this child is born and there's that big meningeal sac that's born on the outside. So your meninges and your spinal cords have been torn and you're going to see very poor motor and sensory in the lower extremities. Also, sometimes because of that meninges that was pulled out that they had to put back in, 
it gets a kink and now the brain fluid doesn't drain the way it should. So sometimes we need to put in a ventricular peritoneal shunt to drain it, okay? Spina bifida, because of the nerves, they can have neurological impairment, right? They're not gonna move their low extremities. With that, you've gotta be careful of their bladders. And also you have to be careful of for constipation. They don't feel it, they don't know it. Many of these children end up with um, every four hour Foley catheters, um, you know, doing a catheter on them. They can have that crooked spine scoliosis and from birth, we put them latex allergy just to be sure. You know, really today we don't use much latex. There's very little latex out there. I'm latex allergy. So I, I know what's happened. And I became a latex allergy in the early 80s when HIV came out and they just started throwing out gloves and they were all latex and my body didn't like it. Uh, I moved to a children's hospital and they didn't use it at all. And today I haven't found a latex glove anywhere. Remember folic acid, what you've learned about this, those neural tube deficiencies that you could see, you should take it before you wanna get pregnant. Um, it's just a vitamin that we take. So the hydrocephalus could be part of the spina bifida. It's uh, the obstruction, it, blood, the cerebrospinal fluid doesn't flow the way it should. And we know that we need to remove it. And we'll do that through that shunt. What we'll see in hydrocephalus is that um, increased intracranial pressure. You know, you'll see those fontanelles up and swollen. You're going to see, uh, because all of the pressure in the head, it pushes on the brainstem. So pulses go down, blood pressures go down, you know, and it really, um, it needs to be treated with that um, VP shunt to keep that fluid at a steady balance. We always need, if we know, if we can know what a child's baselines are, you know, not all kids have, you know, this is the normal baseline. I mean, kids are all, have their own specific things about them. So when you're working with hydrocephalus, always look, what, what would you see in increased uh, intracranial pressure? You might see headache, you might see vomiting, you know, you might see those vital signs changing. The heads of the bed should be elevated, right? The, um, the VP shunt goes into the fourth ventricle. It's a tube that runs behind the ear, down the front chest and into the peritoneal cavity. And what we need to know is there's like a pump behind the ear. We never, 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 never touch that. You leave it alone. We all measure head circumference and abdominal circumference, but we leave it alone. Seizures, tonic clonic. This is the old girl mall. It's like the whole body goes and you lose your consciousness. Tonic is just stiffness and the clonic is the spasm. Now, there's some times where all of a sudden they look and an eye will twitch. Could be your hand movement. Myoclonic is like all of a sudden a brief contracture of a muscle for whatever reason. And then you have these drop attacks called atonic. So one of the things that causes seizures in children is that parents are non-compliant. Also, the kids not getting a bigger dose as they get older and gaining more weight and our bigger children. That's probably one of the biggest things I've seen with it. So any seizures, don't put anything in the mouth. Or yes, we're gonna watch them. We're gonna turn them on their side. We're gonna have suction at the bedside, but that's not going in the mouth. That's just where their mouth is. If they vomit, we clear it so they can continue to breathe. We need to get that environment secure, move anything that can hurt them. And we're gonna pad the side rails if we can, take the pillow out, keep the airway open and put the bed flat. And those things will teach our parents also. So bacterial meningitis, you know, we have viral and we have bacterial. The way we determine if it's viral or bacterial is always a spinal tap. A spinal tap that's bacterial will show white blood cells and it will look like milk. A viral 
will be clear. It'll just be clear looking. And what it is is the meninges get this infection. And can you imagine the headache and the photosensitivity, you know, that can happen? Remember, if they are bacterial meningitis, they need to be placed in a um, room that's isolated. When I think that there's meningitis, always protect yourself with your mask first because it's airborne and then get this child to a room with that reverse flow um, to protect everybody else. They need to be placed on antibiotics, of course, priority, it's a bacterial, you need to kill the infection. And after 24 hours, they can come off that isolation, but they need to be there first. And they will have fevers and headaches, so acetaminophen, ibuprofen to be given. We will check neuroscience because of extra pressure in the brain and because of that photosensitivity, a quiet, darker room, and because it's the head being affected, always be on seizure precautions. Position their head, do they like it up? Do they like it down? Where do they like it? You know, get them comfortable. Um, in infants, we're gonna be measuring the head circumference. You know, maybe it could turn into hydrocephalus that can't control it. Again, intake output, you're talking about brain and fluid balance in the brain and not having too much fluid there. And these children should get the hip vaccine. It prevents that H influenza infection, which can go up into the brain. So make sure with meningitis, we don't, over, I mean, any kid, head injury, increased intracranial pressure, you know, meningitis. Make sure that we are there monitoring intake and output and not over hydrating them because it can cause more cerebral edema there. And remember, with this extra flu fluid there, it can press on the pituitary gland, which diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, the anterior lobe, fluid balance, it can affect it. Now, the inappropriate antidiuretic homodrome, that retains fluid. So watching intake and output on these children. Ray syndrome, we've mentioned a little bit. We know it's from the aspirin, but it's also due to a viral infection. Brain tumors. Well, how would we know there's a brain tumor on a child? Well, a brain tumor is um, something in the head that is usually growing, sometimes slow, sometimes big, usually. Headache, and it, when they wake up, it's there. Or it can wake them up at night, it's so bad. Vomiting, not related to feeding, and usually you're not nauseous, all of a sudden you just vomit. And changing of behavior, visions, um, in infants, you might see those fontanelles getting bigger, those sutures coming apart. Um, because of this pressure in the head, it can affect posture, cognition, all of these things. Now, postoperatively, these children um, need to be treated very carefully. Some of these tumors are like huge. And do we lay them on that side or on the other side? Do we keep them flat, 45 degree, 30 degree angles? We really need to watch that. And again, we're going to, because of the brain and worried about fluid and overhydration, we're going to be really watching intake and output. <clears throat> muscular dystrophy and most common, most tested is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Muscles which are continually weaking. Remember, muscles include diaphragm and the heart, and that's usually by adolescence these children die. But what do we see? These children usually are boys ages three to seven. And they are about three years old. You're going to see them where they were walking a little bit better. They're going to be waddling, like really placing their feet, falling down, being clumsy. Their low back is going to be sometimes will curve in. 
Sometimes you're going to see their uh, calves and sometimes their upper arms. It's called pseudo hypertrophy, means they're going to be enlarged. Um, I guess the muscles are just getting tense and trying to move with it. These children are cognitively delayed. The, what our goal on these children is to um, keep them active, um, physical speech, occupational therapy. Um, these kids can be overweight, so we got to make sure that they're not. And usually they end up where they're wheelchair dependent, okay? And then confined to bed, and that's where their hearts and their lungs go, and that's when they die. Down syndrome. What do we know about Down syndrome? A lot of different things. It's the oval face. It's the tongue. It's cardiac conditions. You know, other things that Down's children can have is leukemia and also um, hypothyroidism. There are three things with those children. So you can have hypothyroidism. You can have congenital heart defects. And you also can have leukemia. Those three things you see a lot in Down's kids. Scissoring is, you know, when their legs are scissoring and seizures. Myelomeningocils, what's priority with these children? Well, it's monitoring urine, monitoring stool, and um, keeping that meningeal sac moist and protecting it from infection. Signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure in older kids. You know, again, this is headaches. This is vomiting. This is, you know, they um, could have lower heart rates because of the, the pressure in there. And they can go into shock. Parents of a newly shunted kid, you know, remember, don't touch that pump. Leave it alone. Um, and monitor for signs of shunt malfunction which is simply headaches and vomiting. Three major goals for experience of seizure. Again, that is protection and keeping that airway open. <clears throat> does anybody know what phenoyton is? What is it used for? Does anybody know? It's number seven. Is that is that a seizure medicine also? Yes, it is Dilantin. Yes, thank you, Candy. It is a medication, most common of all of the medications we use for seizure. Phenoyton or Dilantin is the name. Biggest side effect is hyperplasia of the, the, the gingival, gingival, gingival hyperplasia. So the skin over the teeth get really full and thickened. It also causes um, acne and hair growth in places which isn't normal for young kids. Those are a couple that you would see. Signs and symptoms of a kid with meningitis? Well, you know, that photophobia, the headache, could be vomiting, fever. Antibiotics are prescribed. Usually those are your for bacterial, um, like a staph. Positioned after brain tumor surgery. Well, we're not going to be putting them on the side of the surgery. We don't want that head, the brain to be sucked into the other side, right? Literally. But um, again, always check doctor's off, um, orders. Nursing interventions for increased intracranial pressure. We're going to do everything to try to keep it as low as possible. And inheritance of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It comes from mom. It's an X um, gene that causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So it would have to go through some genetic testing this mother, um, if she wanted another child. And Gower sign. I, I laugh at this because I get on the floor, I get up, and I walk up my legs to get up. It's because of muscle weakness. That is Gower sign. Acute glomerular nephritis, again, we've talked about it. It's a strep infection. What do you see? Well, if you look at a, an anti-streptolysin, an ASO titer be elevated, well, look at the word strep in there. What it's telling you is what you thought was a viral pharyngitis was a strep throat that wasn't, in fact, was, wasn't taken care of. And you can have elevated BONs and creatinines because the kidneys stop working. You become 
oliguric. Signs and symptoms are that strep, um, we're an oliguric, fluid's going somewhere. So a lot of times you see that periorbital. It's usually confined to the face, believe it or not. And they get big pudgy faces with it. They're irritable, lethargic, and their blood pressure goes up. And they got all this extra fluid. They're having dark colored, red, brown urine, almost Coca-Cola color, they can call it, and protein area. <clears throat> so... As a nurse, what do we need to do? Well, as we determine what it is, we're going to be monitoring their blood pressure. If they need blood pressure medicine, they're going to get it. But intake, output, daily weights, looking fluid balance is the big thing. How do we keep the fluids from being retained? That's going to be re, um, monitoring fluid intake and low sodium diet. Also low potassium, again, if they're not urinating at all. They should be resting, again, monitoring for seizures because of that high blood pressure and because nothing is fluid coming out. Where is that fluid going? Congestive heart failure, it's going into the lungs. And then um, usually you're not gonna see this go to renal failure. Usually we can turn this around and then these kids do okay. Again, it was a strep infection, you need to treat it. So. Decreased urinary output is one of the first signs of renal failure. And we know that if the specific gravity doesn't change, it probably is what you say is renal failure because the kidneys are not having the ability to do anything with that fluid. <clears throat> now, nephrotic syndrome. <clears throat> This is something you're born with. This is something that's for life. This is not something that you can treat with an antibiotic. This is the kidney, it's not renal failure. Kidneys are working. It's the kidney saying, yuck, I don't like you protein and gets rid of all the protein in the body. And when you get rid of the protein, it's also albumin. Albumin is another word for protein. So the albumin in your blood goes away too. So a lot of fluid goes interstitial, right? Goes into all of the tissues um, with that. So edema, generalized, severe. With all of that, you know, and all the extra fluid on them, they're lethargic, they don't want to eat, their mouths, their tongues are fluid. They don't feel like eating, they're biting their tongues and their, their cheeks. You will have frothy appearing urine. That's the protein. It looks like beer. That's what it looks like. Again, mass of protein urea, and the lipids go up on that one. So these children are immunosuppressed. So always watch for infection. So keep them um, away from kids that are sick or other adults that are sick, okay? Skin care, especially if they're swollen, make sure that you know we're turning, positioning, rubbing them, whatever they need done. Steroids is what we give for this when we're seeing it at the acute phases. Again, monitoring intake, output, daily weights. That's always, again, this is a fluid problem they are retaining. So small frequent feedings with normal normal protein because you don't give more it's not going to do anything they're still going to get rid of it until the steroids kick up an anti-inflammatory but because of the extra fluid it's a low salt diet on these children but big thing is weigh them and intake output urinary tract infection infants well usually infants and children believe it or not first thing is they stop eating that's usually the first thing that we see. And then all of a sudden they might vomit. Those are the two things. Now, older kids, you might see them running to the bathroom, you know, that frequency, urgency, and you might see hematuria or you might see them bedwetting at night. In infants, you're again, they'll stop eating, they might vomit, but you might smell the urine. Um, and you might have a fever on them and, and they're irritable because their tummies hurt. So infants that come in that are having this not eating fever and maybe vomited once, we're gonna be doing a urine cath for them 
infants will get catheterized because we want a good specimen on infants. They don't have an immune system, right? So we need to get that first time what antibiotic will work instead of coming back three times because we bagged them. It doesn't work. It just gets skin contamination on there, okay? Older kids, you know, the three, four-year-old that we can clean them off. I've seen parents clean them off, stand them on top of the sinks, all right, and put the cup underneath and tell them to urinate. Let them pee a little bit and they grab it. Whatever has to be done to get the good specimen, right? We need to teach them, make sure they finish all the medicine or they're not going to get rid of that infection. They need to go back for follow-up to do a urinalysis to make sure it's clean. No bubble baths. Increasing fluids is the biggest thing we can do. And increasing acidic. Apple and cranberry juice are the two big ones. I mean, I always thought it was just cranberry juice, but it's apple too. I mean, Christian, my grandson, that's give me apple juice and he's happy. Um, and making sure if they need to go to the bathroom that they don't hold it. Isn't that what kids do? They hold it and they hold it. And then you see them wiggling because they don't want to miss something. And then teaching them how to wipe front to back. Nephroblastoma. This is a tumor on the kidney. And it is extremely delicate and fragile. And if you touch it, you can put off little pieces and it can cause metastasis. You might see it with, for instance, I had the kid who came in from Haiti and I didn't know what was going on and I did an assessment and I felt the mass in the abdomen and I knew what was going on. They might have fever, they might have pallor. Uh, of course, kidney, you always watch a blood pressure, right? Um, hematuria, but not, um, that's a rare thing. But the biggest thing, nursing care, is making sure there's signs all over the place. No abdominal palpation and be careful for changing diapers. Hypospadias epispadias. In a male, you should have the urethra come out to the end of the penis. Well, in hypospadias, it's somewhere on the bottom of the penis. And an epispadias is somewhere on the top of the penis. And what they have to do is keep the foreskin. And usually before one year old, before potty training, they will go through, they actually open and fillet the penis. They make that little cavity the tube, they put a little catheter in there, close it up, use the foreskin as their plastic closure. They leave that little catheter in, we do nothing with it. And then these kids will have a normal place for their meatus. Renal failure, it's all about, can be caused by just dehydration. Remember I said earlier, dehydration is horrible. Well, dehydration can cause acute renal failure. Um, trauma. I've seen kids, uh, eight, nine-year-old kids playing hide and go seek and coming around the corner and his back hit the trailer hitch right at the level of the kidney. He came in with a fractured kidney. His potassium was, you know, 7.6, I think. Renal failure can happen due to congenital stuff, uh, obstructions, and it can happen due to infections. Signs and symptoms of acute glomerular nephritis with nephrosis. Again, we know the antecedent event is strep. Signs and symptoms are not urinating, high blood pressure, and fluid retention, right? Physiologic re reason why you see hypoproteinemia. Well, they're getting rid of all of their protein, aren't we? We're just disputing it. Prednisone administration, well, one thing about prednisone, remember if we're giving it and it's for a certain amount of time, if it's longer than that, they need to taper the dose off. Very important. That's why they give you medrol dose packs, which go from like seven pills to one. So they show you what to do there, right? Uh, interventions for our UTI, well, 
increasing fluids, um, urinating when you need to, wiping front to back, no bubble baths. And they see little girls should be wearing cotton underwears and not those cute little tights that look so neat on them. What is the pathophysiology, vesicular, ureteral reflux? Well, the vesicle is the bladder. Vesicle, ureter, up the ureters. There's those little sphincters between the bladder, the vesicle, and the ureters. They don't work. So you're getting this urine going up and refluxing into the ureters, and it can cause infections. Priorities for Wilm tumor is no palpating. And we know hypospadias is done uh, before it reaches preschool. They even do it before then. It's because they don't want them. Remember, preschoolers, they're all about castration and their penis. Remember, they're afraid of that. So it must be done before they're realizing those things. Usually, as I said, before like one, um, they want to get these done. Now, some GI stuff, cleft lip, cleft palate. Remember, GI is mouth to anus. Cleft lip, cleft palate is a thing. The biggest thing at first is all about eating. Um, you can't put a seal around it. You can't suck. So it's a big thing. Um, because of the opening in the palate, it, you know, and fluid, remember, if it goes up the oral pharynx and it doesn't go where it needs to go, Where's the outlet? Remember, it's the ears, ear infections. And with those ear infections, hearing loss could be dental problems, depending on that big hole in the palate. And even with the cleft lip, they can't pronunciate the words because of their lips. So it's speech problems, okay? And we know that if they're having speech problems, it's a social, emotional, we need to fix it as soon as possible. Remember, there are um, children that are born, and some of them are pretty hard to look at for a parent. Um, and letting that parent know what's going to be done, when it's going to be done, how we're going to fix it. Um, and focus on, oh, look how much hair your baby has. Or, wow, your baby's got big feet. You know, or look at those cheeks. I just want to pinch them. Don't focus on this because that's going to be fixed. Esophageal atresia, tracheoesophageal fistula. This is all about eating. This is all about an esophagus that doesn't attach to the stomach. That's an atresia. And tracheoesophageal fistula is a tube that goes from the esophagus to the trachea. So fluid goes down the esophagus into the lungs. Both of these are absolutely nothing to eat or drink. It goes directly in the lungs and causes reflux. So we need to do surgery as quick as we can. Now, till the kid gets to surgery, make sure we have the head of the bed elevated. We have suction at the bedside. And if they need oxygen, absolutely. Um, remember, we're trying to keep that airway open. They're coughing and they're sputtering because even mucus they swallow is aspirating. And again, they're not eating. So what do we need to give them? Give them their pacifier. Pyloric stenosis. This is vomiting. This is usually you'll see it somewhere between three weeks and three months is when I usually see it. These kids are eating, drinking, but the valve that empties into the intestines is big and hypertrophic and doesn't allow the milk to go down. Not any. So the kid all of a sudden eats, 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 and then projectile, I'm talking 10 feet, 15 feet, it will throw the, their vomit across the room. Because of that, they're hungry, and they're hungry, and they keep crying because they want to eat, right? You're going to be worried about dehydration. They're throwing up stomach acid, so metabolic alkalosis, that's what's left. You're going to see a kid, I've always said, when you see a young infant come in with vomiting, is it dribbling or is it across the room? Across the room immediately, nothing more to eat or drink. And then I put my hand up underneath the xiphoid process and a little bit to the right side, and you'll feel an olive or a marble is actually another way for it, and you feel it. 
they do your ultrasound and they do surgeries and they do really, really well. Postoperatively, we'll just start out with some clear liquids. Um, make sure they're on the right side. That helps keep the food going down, believe it or not. And having their head of their beds elevated and always burping frequently. And again, fluid, worried about it, intake, output, daily weights. Into susception, all of these are poor little toddlers usually. And all of a sudden they say that he was fine. And all of a sudden he started screaming, kicking his legs. I don't know what to do. And then he stopped, but then on here he is doing it again. The intestines suck up into each other like a telescope. It's acute intermittent pain. You cannot console these kids, no matter what you do. If you look at their diaper or sometimes even in their underwear, you'll see a current jelly with maybe a little bit of blood in there. It looks like it. And there's a sausage shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. It's telling you there's something going on. It's pushing pressure backwards. These children usually do okay. Um, they'll do an ultrasound if they find it. Sometimes they have to do a reduction. Many of the times we're just going to give them some high fiber and we'll send them home. Hirschsprungs. This is usually found at birth. This is usually one of those children that doesn't have a stool right after birth. Because usually infants come out having stools, right? Meconium, I mean, instantly. But nothing for 24 to 36 hours are going to be checking this for Hirschsprungs. Now, Hirschsprung's is an intestinal obstruction. And it's an intestinal obstruction because there's no nerve cells. So what goes down, there's no peristalsis getting it down to go out the rectum. So that intestine gets large and large. And it's just causing this obstruction. Now, you're going to say, but doesn't that hurt? Well, there's no nerves. No, it does not hurt. So... When we figure it out, we know that this child, nothing, nothing should be put in that child's rectum. These children will only have those axillary temperatures. And these kids, these infants, will be going for a colostomy, all right? And it's usually put a colostomy, and then they'll go back and close it, usually before a year old. Appendix, we have ruptured, and then we can have an abscess. We know appendix when it's bright and it's, you know, just starting right lower quadrant, McBurney point and rebound tenderness. And then all of a sudden the pain stops and now you're perforated. You know, if it's perforated, we know that these children are going to need antibiotics postoperatively. That would be priority. Celiac disease is due to the villus in the small intestines does not like this thing called gluten. And gluten is in wheat, rye, barley, and oats. This is on your breads. This is on your stuffings. This is on your macaronis and spaghettis and your oatmeal. And it is, um, if they eat it, they get severe pain. These children have extremely foul, greasy smelling stools, okay? Um, abdominal distension and cramping. And because they're not getting nutrition, guess what? They're not going to grow the way they should. So it's a nutrition thing. So keep them on a gluten-free diet. Rice is a great alternative. And again, these kids, because of nutrition, it's one of the reasons why we do daily weights and we do um, weights and height. Every child going to a doctor's office, urgent care, anywhere. Gastroenteritis, so vomiting and diarrhea, right? So what do we have to worry about? Well, we're losing fluid again. So again, intake output, we're going to be doing weights on them, I'm monitoring for dehydration and making sure we're giving those electrolytes back to them. We as nurses, we're going to be making sure we wear gloves and we're going to be hand washing. These children don't give them any of this sugary stuff, okay? These kids will get Pedialyte, they'll get IV fluids, and we don't want to stop an infection inside. That's why we don't give like kale pectate. We don't do that because it just keeps that infection in the intestines. So GI, feeding techniques for cleft lip and palate. There's all sorts of bottles that we use for them. 
we'll close that lip by two to three months and that helps. Signs and symptoms of this esophageal tresia and tracheal esophageal fistula is all about they can't eat, they don't tolerate it, spit and sputtering and turning cyanotic, so NPO and give them a pacifier, right? Post-op pyloric stenosis, start out with clear liquids. Barium enema is one of the things that we do use to treat an intussusception. It pushes that intestine out, it's in, but then it makes it come out. It's one of the tricks that they do. Care for a child with a temporary colostomy. Well, you're gonna get the ostomy nurse in there and talk to you and talk to the family, right? We do sometimes have something called an imperforated anus, which means there was never an anus. It wasn't made, it wasn't there. So signs of it, there's just no rectum. There, there's no anus there. And again, that one has to have a colostomy too. And later on, they'll go back and try to make one, but it's a couple stage surgery. Iron deficient anemia. Most common um, ages for iron deficient anemia that we see is your toddlers. This is your finicky, psychologic, anorexic children, right? That was physiologic. I don't wanna eat because they don't need as much food at this time but they're not getting the iron fortified formula, you know, so they're not eating as much iron. So usually it's all about nutrition here. Remember with iron deficient anemia, if we don't correct it, the hemoglobin and hematocrit are low, the heart's beating faster, it's flowing all over the place and it works too hard and you can go into cardiac failure, okay? And because you're not getting nutrition, failure to thrive. Those are your normal numbers that you would see for a hemoglobin. If we know that they're low, we know if the hemoglobin's low, they don't have oxygen, right? They don't have enough. So if they don't have enough oxygen, they're gonna tire easy. So that's why you get rest breaks. You're gonna get oral um, iron. Remember oral iron, if they can take it, should be in a straw so they don't get their teeth stained and it should be given with orange juice because it is digested in the stomach with stomach acid and orange juice helps. Never, never, never give it with milk. And it shouldn't be given after meals. It should be for meals. The stomach acid works better, okay? And then here are some uh, dietary sources of iron. You have meat, green leafy vegetables, fish, liver, whole grains, legumes, and iron fortified cereals and formulas, of course. Hemophilia is when you bleed. That means something that your body is supposed to have to stop you bleeding is just not there. You're going to see a simple blood test called the PTT. It's going to be prolonged. I think the normals are about 40. Sometimes you see them at three, 400. So these children are really apt to bleed. So these children will be placed on bleeding precautions, right? We're always gonna be watching for that. So one of the things we need to be careful about is um, when they bleed, it goes into their joints. It can damage the joints and they can become crippled because of that. Um, little minor bleeds, you know, it's that rice, rest, ice, contain, elevate, that can help. If they have the factor at home, they can take it. Toothbrushes, remember gums tend to bleed and more medium are hard bristles, so soft. And then a young child, think about a toddler, how they're bumping into everything all the time, making sure we have things protected for them. And these kids should have a medical alert on them somewhere so people know it. Sickle cell is, um, the shapes of the cells are sickled and they get stuck inside the vessels. And it's usually due that the vessels are too small due to dehydration or lack of fluid, and it creates a lot of pain, right? These children are immunosuppressed. They have their cells die really quickly, so they're in chronic anemia, okay? And with that chronic anemia, you're gonna have, the child's gonna be delayed growth. Hydration, hydration, hydration on these kids. That's always number one. So it opens, expands the vessels and they can go through. 
Iron does nothing for these kids, all right? It has nothing to do with iron with them. But what they do do is they give folic acid because folic acid helps with red blood cells. Acute lymphocytic leukemia. This is the uh, proliferation of immature white blood cells is what it's called. So you have these white blood cells that are just really not being formed. And these children um, are, are severely immunosuppressed and they'll be uh, getting infections like crazy. So how do we treat it? Well, we're gonna be treating it with chemotherapy. And there are four stages to that. Well, the first one is the most important. It's usually the first four to six weeks. And they hit these children with what I call the big guns, a lot of chemotherapy. And the goal is remission when they're done with induction which means cancer's wiped out. But you know how cancer can be sneaky and hide, right? So the sanctuary consolidation and maintenance are there to prevent it from reforming on itself. Um, with ALL, always have that epi ready because when you're giving these meds, there can be anaphylaxis to these things. I mean, you always should have epi and oxygen, even when giving an antibiotic for a first time to a kid. You don't know if they're going to get allergic to it. Prednisone is usually given, and it does help with those sort of things. It, it, it reduces a lot of the reactions to it. And allopurinol is what we use for gout, which is uric acid. Hematological disorders. Information about iron, I've told you, through a straw, if it's liquid, and with orange juice, never milk. We know the sources of iron, the hydration. Remember, kids with sickle cell, they're outside, especially here in South Florida. They should always have a water bottle with them. Always hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. You don't have to stop them from being active. Just have them fluid, 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 right? And then um, nursing interventions and medical treatment for children with leukemia. You know, with leukemia, we're just going to make sure that we keep infection away from them, you know, and we get them to that remission and, and we can send them on their way. I mean, today we really cure leukemia much even more than 20 years ago. Congenital hypothyroidism. What did I tell you hypothyroids are all about? cognition and growth, right? And everything else of adults, you know, the sparse hair, the dry skin, constipation, cold intolerance, those are adult things. But in children, our concern is cognition and growth. So we do a T3, T4, TSH, look at all of them. And we know that um, these children um, will show if they're deficient. Now, remember hypothyroidism, everything's down. They're not as active, right? So that quiet baby, the one that sleeps a lot, that'd be one that you would actually test and ask more questions. One of the things that we do, this is another one of those things that we test for at birth if they're not stooling, because they can have that constipation, right? Of course, they're tired, uh, they got poor suck. They could have that jaundice, you know, needing those lights. Could have problems with maintaining temperatures, a large protruding tongue. And again, coarse hair, tired, flat aspect, constipation, you know, and then we're talking about activity and whatnot and growth, hypertonia. So these children do get a bunch of different things. They do all of those metabolic testings. If they're stooling, we know we're okay. Um, again, when we're giving thyroid hormones, whether adult or children should be in the morning because it sort of perks you up, right? Perks you up. Same time every day in the morning and always watching for side effects. If we're giving this to perk you up, if you are over perked up, heart rate's up, feeling too much up, that could be too much medicine. And that's something that we could talk to the doctor about. But again, if they're not perked up and they're still tired, again, that's something we need to talk, maybe get some more lab values on it, right? So they're gonna need those periodic drug tests, you know, those levels. 
phenylketonuria. You know, this is all about those little dots and it talks about um, nutrition and the ability to use nutrition that's given to them. Um, these children, if they don't get what they need, um, again, central nervous system, cognitive impairments, and there are PKU diets that we put them on. So strict adherence to that low phenylalanine diet, they have special formulas um, and they should not have certain things as they get older. High protein, like let's be careful with meat, milk, dairy, and eggs. And they can have the vegetables, fruits, etc. So NutraSweet, you know, is something that should not be given to a child with PKU. I mean, I don't know why you would give NutraSweet to a child though. Diabetes mellitus, this three Ps, it has to do with, I'm hungry, 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 because I'm not using my sugar. It's just in my blood. And I'm thirsty, 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 and I urinate, urinate, urinate. And you might see this child bedwetting when they weren't before. So type one diabetes are usually your young kids, your you know, younger, two, three-year-olds. You might see type two in your older um, adolescent that are overweight type thing. So um, one of the things that we see with the older children type two is they're overweight and they don't have enough physical activity. So congenital hypothyroidism could be no stool at birth or very tired, um, sleepy all the time. Um, what do you see if you don't treat congenital hypothyroidism? Well, it's going to be one-year-old. They're still not sitting up by themselves, right? Cognitive delays. Um, they're not going to be growing the way that they should. Um, signs of diabetes, P, P, and P, polyphagia, polyuria, polydipsia, and then nursing care of a child with keto dia, ketoacidosis. Well, we're going to be checking their blood sugar. We're going to be checking their urine. We're going to get an IV in them, give them fluids and give them insulin. And we're going to get that blood sugar down. One of the things with school age children and diabetes, they always need to carry, you know, something with them to prevent the hypo hyperglycemia. Nail fractures. Fractures are all different types. They're either open or they're closed. The biggest thing with fractures is when it hits the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate. And if it's not set correctly, um, it's gonna have a disfigurement of the bone. Um, we also worry about infection with open them. Remember, it's the rice, what we do first, rest, ice, contain, and elevate, and get them to care. They put on a cast. And now what we need to be worried about is how is the cast okay? And that's the what we're going to watch out for lack of blood flow, pain, pallor, pulses, paresthesia, and paralysis. This is probably there's swelling going on in that cast, and it could get to the point of compartmental syndrome, which means blood flow is gone. You can lose fingers, toes, and everything. Remember with traction, we need to keep that weights hanging there and that we need to have the child in good position checking for neurovascular signs. If there is skeletal traction, always make sure we're doing pin care, clean it the way you should. And in skin traction, you never take it off for no reason. You're just gonna put that bone back where it was. Always keep it on 24 hours a day. And children don't like shots, so don't do it. Give it in the IV if you can. Congenital dislocated of the hip. I heard there was some questions on this. Um, on the HESI, one student told me, remember they put on the Pavlik harness or the Freccia or Von Rosen splint. And what it does, it abducts them, the, the hips. So it goes back into the hips and that we leave it on 23 hours a day. Um, the hip doesn't go into the socket, it's up here. So you have a short leg and you can really tell. Scoliosis, we see this a lot at that pre-adolescent growth spurt. 
you're going to see a shoulder down. You're going to see when they're bending over, you can see that rib hump that you can see again in a brace, a Milwaukee brace, 23 hours a day with a t-shirt underneath and make sure they check for skin and making sure it's okay. And then it's exercise. If they're going to do the surgery on these children called the Harrington rods or Lukey rods that will straighten out that spine, this is when we're going to log roll. Very important to keep that child straight. Pillar between the knees, have two people, hip and shoulder come together, okay? And make sure we do it that way. JIA, JRA, it's an inflammation of the joints. Our biggest thing is to keep it moving. Taking NSAIDs is what you take, and then maybe some anti-rheumatoid um, methotrexate, or you've heard of Humira, or combinations of them. And steroids are usually used for when um, they are at a flare, where they're really hurting. We don't like it too much because what do steroids do? Weight gain and um, Cushing syndrome, right? Skeletal disorders, neurovascular assessments. Remember, it's looking for the pulses and the capillary refills. Compartment syndrome is when it's just swollen and now no blood's flowing. Fractures the epiphyseal plate. We're concerned of growth. We don't want to crook, or, crook it or shorten leg or arm. Skeletal traction is pins. That's why you have to be careful of it. Spica cast. Now, this is where they put it on when the Pavlik harness doesn't work. And we just got to keep it clean because it's right down there by the private areas, right? Signs of symptoms, congenital heart defect, um, congenital hip dysplasia is a shortened leg. Um, and it's also going to be the gluteal folds things. And then scoliosis is looking at the shape of the spine. And we did all of it today, guys. I know you can do it. I know that HESTES is, is really daunting. Um, you've just had the entire book on NCLEX prep there. I think I've explained it the best I can. And I know you guys are going to do good. Now, I'm also going to be here tomorrow, 2 o'clock, uh, to talk to you again. If you want to come, come. If not, I will give you also that recording. It's RNPN. Let me tell you, both do the same things. I talk to you the same way. You're both going to be nurses and um, nurses as a nurse, right? Any questions for any of you? Well, that's all I've got tonight, guys. Thank you so much for your patience and good luck next week. Let me know how you do. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.